Hi, welcome to Storytelling Animals, a green new podcast of climate ecology and animal justice. My guest today is Kate Soper. She's a philosopher, the author of multiple books, including What is Nature, um, and most recently, uh, the title Post-Growth Living for an Alternative Hedonism. When we think of the word hedonism, we often think of um, you know, putting pleasure above all else in a way that means, you know, not caring about others, not caring about the environment necessarily, and kind of, uh, into conventional luxuries. Um, uh, Kate Soper's argument here is that, um, you know, a, the truest luxury or the, the truest pursuit of pleasure, um, would actually mean, uh, moving beyond our environmentally destructive form of consumerism that we have, um, in travel and food and fashion in, electronics um, in a number of different uh, industries and ways of life. Um, so yeah, we talk about all that in this interview, why um, why the good life uh, maybe can only be achieved once we've uh, shed the shackles of consumer culture as we know it, um, and why this would be good for the earth at the same time. Um, it's, I think, a, a nice companion interview to my episode last week, which was about how I try to take a train or a bus instead of a plane when I can. Um, maybe last week was more about my individual choice. Um, but this week we talk about how choices like that um, aren't strictly individual, uh, how they can become part of a broader um, political cycle, and importantly, how policy and, and state-led um policies and political changes can make choices like this easier. As always, thanks so much to those who support this podcast on Patreon. Uh, you can get early access to episodes, membership in the book club, uh, and other perks at patreon.com slash storytelling pod. Um, and perhaps the greatest perk of all, allow me to keep producing this podcast. Speaking of that book club, um, our next meeting is May 31st to discuss the fifth season by N.K. Jemison. Uh, picked by Esquire as the number one fantasy novel of all time. It explores uh, life on a planet where seismic activity, earthquakes, volcanoes um, make make uh, life for the people who live there really difficult, how some people are able to control some of those forces, um, and yeah, just kind of how a dangerous planet like that shapes the relationship of the people who live there with the Earth. Um I'm really excited to discuss it, uh, and yeah, you can um, join by being a Patreon supporter at the Lorex tier or higher, um, and then you'll also be able to join some of our future meetings, such as um, June 28th, to discuss The Entangled Life uh, by Merlin Sheldrake, which is about fungus, a nonfiction book, and then um, June 26th to discuss The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson, a previous guest on the podcast. Um, yeah, so if you want to come to these meetings and all our future ones, please um, join the uh, Patreon supporters. If you aren't ready to do that yet, but you want to try out a book club meeting as a uh, free trial of sorts, um, just sign up for my weekly newsletter. The link to that is in the episode description. Um, it's also pinned on my Twitter feed. Um, and not only do you get to try out the book club, um, you get updates about this podcast uh, you get, you know, new episodes sent to your inbox. You get um, occasionally some behind the scenes uh, insights about making the podcast. Uh, sometimes I'll send updates on issues that have been discussed on previous episodes. Um, and I'll also include a link to the best thing I read all week. Um, usually an article uh, about some sort of issue related to environment, animals, climate, uh, stuff like that. Um, so yes, please, um, join that newsletter, uh, and please follow this podcast, like, subscribe, um, rate it. Uh, obviously I'd love a five-star review, but, um, even more, I'd love you to be true to your heart, uh, in terms of what you rate this podcast. Um, but, uh, yeah, without further ado, here's the episode. Hi, I'm here with uh, Kate Soper, the author of 
post-growth living toward an alternative hedonism. Um, Kate, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me. So um, I thought we could start with just the first word of the title, uh, post-growth. Um, what when you talk about growth, do you is that economic growth, growth and consumption, um, and and why do we need to go beyond it? Uh, I'm using it fairly loosely, I guess. I'm not an economist. I should emphasize that I'm a philosopher, so I can't go into detail about the uh, you know what a post-growth uh, economy would look like exactly what i'm what i'm doing is using it both of to to challenge um an economy an economic order a growth driven capitalist economic order uh as being um incompatible now with long term ecological survival incompatible with the with promoting the equality needed to bring about a more sustainable welfare and I'm also suggesting that uh, a growth-driven economy is very dependent on a continuous expansion of growth of GDP, of, of which itself is reliant on um, constant um, innovation and product, um, um, you know, introduction of new new products and services, so that. Be economic growth becomes dependent on the expansion of consumption, and I'm arguing that this is not only unsustainable and generating uh, considerable inequalities, it's also um, not necessarily promoting our own well-being. Even those who are in a position to, as it were, uh, afford and, and enjoy, as we might often, as we often call it. Uh, very highly affluent culture are not necessarily um, are not necessarily doing themselves any good. I mean, there are lots of downsides now. I think to affluent consumption, and I could list some of those for you that I relate to. So my argument overall is that we not only do we need for reasons of climate change and environmental degradation. To shift from a growth-driven economy and constant innovation at the level of material, culture, and services, we also would be advantaged in doing so that we would have a more pleasurable and enjoyable lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So the part of what's distinctive to my argument, if you like, is the challenge to the idea that it would always be regrettable if we were having to give up on a so-called consumer consumerist way of living right i, I don't uh, i don't allow it to i don't agree that it can be seen as the model of the good life i think a lot of environmentalists or some climate activists would you know would say that we'll have to drive less or eat less meat or fly less or buy less or do all these things um but sometimes it's framed as sort of a a you know a noble sacrifice we have to make for ethical reasons or it's just seen as um you know that it's enough to say morally we have to do this to prevent the worst environmental outcomes so we should do it um why is that second part of your argument about why it's actually better for us why is that um something that you you started to to pursue writing about and thinking about well, in part, I think, because I've always been quite concerned to um, move from a position, which is quite common on the left, where one's saying what's wrong with an existing economic order or way of living, and can argue what would be needed to put it right, but, you know, is not in a, a very, um, is not usually very prepared to spell out how we might get from uh, the existing order to the to the one that is claimed to be an improvement on it. So that there's very little um, said really about <clears throat> the agents of transformation or the modes of transformation. Obviously in the past among Marxists and socialists there would be a, 
an appeal to the working class or to proletarian revolution or something of this kind. But I think we no longer plausibly rely on that as a as a as a as a way of thinking about transitional politics. And certainly, I don't uh, think that that is 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 going to 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 figure very largely or successfully in in any transition. So I what I I therefore emphasise here is the need if you like, to appeal more directly to our own self-interest. And I'm talking here not necessarily simply to those in in the working class, but to across the board, that we would all benefit, uh, that it's in our own self-interest to, to think about the possible gains, the alternative politics of prosperity, as it were, that we might um, be in a position to enjoy were we to shift from um, a consumerist way of living so i see it in i see the emphasis on on the pleasure the opportunity to actually enjoy ourselves better to slow down to have more job security to have um, uh, uh, um, less ill health less stress less waste um, to re-cement better forms of community, to avoid traffic congestion, to avoid the massive amount of air pollution we have, to avoid the commercialization of children. I mean, there are opportunities here that we could expand upon, as it were, and win um, and appeal to people uh, to think about as, as the alternative, the, the we would, alternative ways of we would avoid these these negative aspects of consumption, as it were, were we to think in terms of what I've called alternative hedonism and uh, an alternative way of, of living and working. Uh, so, it's, so as I say, it's in part about um, thinking through what might be the possible agency of change. And I think if we only talk about gloom and doom and the belt-tightening impacts of climate change, we're not necessarily going to to appeal very much to people. We also need a more seductive image of an alternative way of living. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's partly about how how are we thinking about the, the transition here? Who are going to be the agents of it? But it's also, I think, the case that there are, if we think about it, there are a lot of negative aspects of our so-called good life. Uh, in addition to the fact that it's unsustainable in planetary terms. Yeah, I think I think I, I totally agree. Uh, and I know this is a a complicated question with a lot of different answers. But if if people, especially in, in wealthier countries, would be happier if we consumed less, why do we still consume so much? Well, I think it's partly the uh, the dominance of corporate capitalism and its uh, marketing and merchandising strategies. I mean, that's to say, I think advertising currently enjoys um, a monopoly, practically, over depictions of the good life, over um, visions of enjoyment and uh, self-realization and human flourishing and so what's squeezed out as it were with current consumer culture and the dominance of advertising within it is the uh, people are not allowed very much sense of what other kinds of ways of living uh, there might be and the ways in which they could find those more satisfactory so it's partly as it were the way in which um we're not allowed to think or envisage other ways of uh, of living, but I, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, I mean, I'm not denying that there are attractions about consumer culture: its convenience, its high speed living, the thrills of that, and so on, uh, and that many people get caught up in it in workaholic modes and so on. Uh, but there are also, I think, now growing. Um, there are signs that people are disaffected with it. They are, you know, that, that they are regretting, as it were, how the lack of the, the time scarcity, their dominance by a work ethic culture, the often 
rather tedious and futile nature of the jobs they end up doing, particularly among the pre- you know, the so-called precariat in the gig economy. Uh, so there are, I think, now at least you know a minority of people who would begin to agree with me, as it were, that um, we could live more enjoyably. Uh, and pleasurably were we to shift from this current mode of of consumerist uh, uh, living and working. So, I, I mean, I suppose I'm saying here, look, how far is it actually true that were people given the opportunity to rethink the ways in which we, uh, we live, how true is it that, 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 that people would not actually... Um, find quite a lot to complain about in terms of the way that we currently conduct ourselves. I mean, some of that actually emerged here at any rate. I don't know if it did in the States during the pandemic. Uh, Because people were working from home, because they had a a little bit more time to reflect on their own consumption, because in many cases they weren't even able to get out and consume in the ways that they had uh, prior to the lockdown period, they also began to find that there were some positive spin-offs and to question whether they really did want to go back to the, you know, the full business as usual model of living. In fact, uh, in the UK here, we had a poll at the end of June during the first lockdown which suggested that only 6% wanted to go back to the economic order that I said earlier obtained of course i mean you know since then we've all gone back and uh, you know, there was another lockdown people became very uh, ground down by the whole experience of the pandemic it was not i'm not suggesting it provided any kind of model for a green living in that sense but you know it, it did actually allow people or some people at any rate to uh, 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 more uh, time to reflect on some of these more negative aspects of the way that they had actually been caught up in Mm -hmm. yeah you you point out in the book that um marxists and socialists and people on the left um are often very astute at pointing out that um you know capitalism and the market consumerist economy we have now are not are not just an automatic outgrowth of human nature um that they aren't you know that it's a specific economic system that we could develop a different one, um, but that sometimes missing from this analysis is our our conceptions of prosperity and well-being and our consumption patterns are also not, you know, just human nature. They're they're shaped by the system we're in and and could be different as well. Yes, I, I mean one of the points I I do make in the book is that I think there is. A tendency, even on the left, to, as I put it, naturalize capitalist consumer culture. Um, in other words, I think on the left, there's proper recognition of the way in which capitalism as a method of production is historical. It's not. It's not something that you know has always been the case and always has to be the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's preceded by other modes of production and so on. Uh, But there's much less willingness, I think, to accept that the consumer culture that it's generated is also not necessarily one to be seen as natural or inevitable, or it's the only one that makes any sense in terms of so-called high standards of living. And what I argue, too, is that this kind of sense of it being natural and inevitable is held right across the political spectrum. I mean, it's it's there amongst the defendants of this status quo, obviously, who cannot, as it were, think outside the box of um, consumer culture as currently constituted. But it's also been quite prevalent um, even among, among the left in the sense that... Um, a lot of emphasis on the left has fallen on the um, the, uh, the the criticism of 
the market of mark of the market has been that it generates inequality and the aim has been to allow for a better distribution of the goods and services of consumer culture rather than to challenge the that culture itself and to suggest that maybe we need to rethink some of the aspects of its so called prosperity. And even among um those who have tried to think through, as they see it, a more utopian post-capitalist future. I'm thinking here about the so-called luxury communists, or sometimes called high-tech socialist utopians. Um, they too tend to suggest that we could make use of a very high degree of automation and very smart technologies to deliver current forms of very affluent, luxurious living for everybody. Um, you know, there was Aaron Bastani is one of them who suggested that we could all have an infinity pool, for example. <laughs> and others have suggested that drones and robots could be developed to do all the work for us, that we would then have you know, time to spend uh, on journeys, uh, space travel would expand, this kind of thing. Well, I mean, I don't, I, I, I actually think that that itself is still caught up, that way of thinking is still caught up in a rather conventional consumerist mindset about, mm -hmm. about how we might uh, enjoy ourselves. Rather, I mean, I don't think we do want necessarily to have all our work done by ro drones and robots and, and uh, to, uh, you know, go off into these uh, 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 sort of universal space travel or infinity pools, <laughs> even if it were possible environmentally, which clearly it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think it necessarily captures the kinds of uh, uh, ideas of of pleasure and uh, um, an enjoyable lifestyle that so uh, that all of us would subscribe to. Do you see what I mean? So then, uh -huh. so there is a way in which a consume the consumer culture has been sort of too little challenged as as one that um, could be changed and might be changed for the better. Mm -hmm. Well, well, let's challenge the uh, consumer culture. I wanted to go through. A few of the specific ways uh, in which you know we could start bringing about this sort of alternative hedonist post-growth living, um, and maybe one place to start that um, is is gaining in, in popularity among environmentalists is uh, is about cars. So what's the what's the argument around driving less or not at all and making our are cities and societies less dependent on car use? Well, it's certainly something I would argue that we should uh, we should look at uh, reducing the reliance on the automobile and the car culture more generally, along with air flight too. Uh, partly, of course, because it is a major uh, contributor to uh, global um, CO two emissions, but it's also um, massively caught up in the creation of, of air pollution. Um, the, the majority of the global population is now affected in some way or another by air pollution and children are especially at risk now uh, with millions of them dying early deaths because of their exposure to polluted air. Uh, in addition, there are a number of other downsides to the reliance on uh, car transport. It uh, commands an enormous amount of public space. I think in some American cities, this is upwards of 60% of the of urban space is um, <laughs> is given over to the the trail, you know, to the, mm -hmm. the transit or the parking or the facilities uh, provided for the automobile culture but it's also uh, it also is responsible it's not a major factor but it's responsible for quite a lot of wildlife destruction and this is at a time when we've been told that um, 
the destruction of ecosystems and wildlife is going to be at least as disastrous for future planetary well-being as climate change itself. So we need to do everything to curb as much of that destruction as possible. And then there are aesthetic reasons, I think, perhaps, associated with car transport, where I'm talking about cars or automobiles, because I'm anyway, but um, where, you know, insulated as you are in a car, you don't actually notice much of the damage that you're doing. You're also cut off from uh, some of the more interesting and and aesthetically pleasurable aspects of of being in the um, natural environment, from the smells and scents and so on. Uh, You have an essentially visual experience. This is something that Alex Wilson, who made a study of the American landscape and the way that the automobile had shaped it, uh, has has written about in in his book about the making of the American landscape, the next one from Disney to get some pal days, I think it's called. Uh, so there are there are a lot of downsides to the automobile culture. Um, however, I recognise that you know it's one thing to say that in the American context, uh, where the spatial distance is so vast that um, you know it is it, probably very difficult for a lot of American people to actually conceive how they could possibly exist without. Uh, without automobile transport Um, and we do need to think about the restoration of other fairly speedy ways of getting around not least I I guess the expansion of trains which can cut down on 90% of the CO2 emissions relative to that of air flight for example Uh, about other people will say electric cars are the answer here and they will certainly cut down pollution however there's there's a problem about the provisioning of ele- the electricity that will be involved, especially given how much more we're going to need with the expansion of the internet on current show. There's problems about the batteries, about both the uh, resourcing of the uh, components for batteries, which can be very, very polluting and problematic um, from an environmental point of view, but also about their disposal. Uh, so what we should aim to do, I think, is to, as, as, as far as possible, reduce the reliance on the automobile, to shift as, as much as possible to electric cars where none, no other method is available, and to think much more in terms of uh, carpooling and car sharing for, for as many journeys as possible. And in general, I think we need to move from a more individualized mode of thinking about the ownership of of these more polluting and problematic aspects of material culture and move to what I think in the States you call a more collaborative or connected way of, of living, which would also have quite a lot of benefits in other respects. It would develop a better sense of community and citizenship and so on. Mm-hmm. I think um, there's a lot that you just talked about that sort of people can start doing now, whether that's, um, you know, for those who are able to start walking or biking more, um, you yeah. know, taking public transit, uh, carpooling. Um, but there are also things that would require um, some sort of government action, like building up more public transit if there's not enough. Um, so what is the relationship between um, our sort of individual consumption and, I guess, more like state-led political change? Obviously, there is a very important relationship. I mean, where, I mean, people cannot be expected to change their individual consumption, at least not beyond uh, you know certain kinds of limits, unless the alternative ways of um, of travelling in this case, for example, are provided for them. So there is a role, a very important role, I think, for state-led initiatives here to provide, for example, 
the forms of public transport, including the investment that could make them very, very cheap or even free to users. Because I think one of the, I don't know if this is true in the States, but one of the reasons that people don't use the buses, even when they're provided here in the UK, is that they are extremely expensive. Um, so we would need to introduce more public transport uh, and also, I think, to make it competitive uh, in terms of price for people to actually shift away from um, the amount of car use that you know, they're currently um, committed to. Uh, and I think, you know, we we also need to see the state as as providing as as take as kind as kind of taking initiatives of being proactive in putting forward ways of um encouraging more sustainable forms of consumption even where people may be reluctant to see their benefits at first and then in the light of the experiences that are provided by new state-led initiatives, people come to support them more and they don't turn out to be as they might otherwise have been vote losers if had they been put to people before they'd been actually instigated. So I refer here to a kind of alternative hedonist dialectic whereby having the experience of um, a more sustainable form of consumption can actually bring with it much more popular support for it. One of the examples I give is the introduction of congestion charging in London, where mm. it would almost certainly have been um, voted down had it simply gone to a vote prior to its introduction. But because, in virtue of its introduction, it provided people with the, the pleasurable experiences of less congested streets, it became more popular and uh, it was then expanded with uh, general public support. So that could be, you know, made applicable in more areas where there was a, a will, as it were, to do so. So we, uh, I'm not, I don't think that the, the kind of transformation that is going to be needed for long-term sustainable um, consumption can be brought about simply by people individuals uh, changing their ways it also it needs to interact with systemic changes for which alone i think the state can really be the major actor but we need in order for states to become major actors and here again there's a kind of dialectic if you like people need themselves to uh, press them into making those changes people need we need to, as it were, insist that governments bring in measures that lead to the forms of self-policing that would actually allow for more sustainable and pleasurable ways of living. Mm -hmm. Do you see, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you say kind of in the book that, that kind of with the environmental issues we're facing that we can also have some change power as consumers uh, but that it's not just how we consume, but how that then becomes part of a, a broader political process that you're talking about. Yes, I mean, I don't think we're going to have a transition to a less growth-dominated way of living, a less profit-oriented, um, deregulated market, um, unless we have some kind of political formation, I suppose. I mean, mm -hmm. in the book, I suggest this is some kind of political party that takes on that agenda and um, promotes a cultural, a cultural rethinking of the notion of prosperity. I mean, to an extent, I think, both here and in the United States, we've had the major political parties. It's been essentially a bipartisan system and the major political parties have debated about the best ways of meeting ends that are actually agreed across you know, their differences. So they agree on 
the need to promote growth, the expansion of GDP, uh, the continuation of um, high standards of living as defined by consumer culture. Um, and the differences are often about how best to deliver on that agenda, or they, or they have been. I mean, until quite recently, the, obviously the environmental crisis is beginning to complicate some of that kind of discourse now. Um, but there has been what I call politics, mainstream politics has been driven by differences about the means to particular ends rather than by re you know, getting the, their electorates to rethink what the ends might be and whether we could live better if we weren't so dominated by the idea simply of commercialised values and instrumental um, thinking. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, let's um, let's go back. You, you know, we talked about cars where I think, um, you know, I lived in Chicago, a city where I didn't need a car. I was able to use public transit, uh, at least on mm-hmm. uh, and, and biking. And I, it was really nice not to have a car. Um, mm. I think you mentioned air flight as well. And that's something that uh, maybe especially in the United States might be a bit of a harder sell um, for some anyway, because I think there is a, a real convenience to, to planes. You know, I'm someone who has taken uh, some train and bus trips across, you know, overnight, two nights. Uh, and I think there is a lot that is really enjoyable about them, about the shifting scenery of the country, getting to know people from all over. Uh, and also, you know, it, <laughs> it's a little less comfortable sleeping on a train uh, than, um, you know, just a, a four-hour flight would have been. Um, yeah, yeah. So what... Uh, what are kind of the, the the hedonist elements of just kind of a, a slower travel paradigm? Well, I, I mean, I think, I mean, you're right. And I think that equally in America, it's a difficult sell to suggest that we should cut back on air flight. However, um, I, I think it could be um, curbed um, quite considerably. I mean, maybe people could think in terms of air flight as a two or three times a year max or something that was a, a luxury rather than simply the ordinary way of thinking about um, traveling. And maybe it is an area here where it's not, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a, a more austere or belt tightening form of consumption, but maybe we do all of us need to think about the amount of travel we do do currently and the ways in which we don't think twice about, you know, fly, flying um, quite long distances for fairly, um, you know, relatively unimportant um, activities sometimes, I think, um, because of the cheapness of air flight, particularly in recent years, this has it's been very common for people, particularly in Europe, to just travel from one part of the continent to another for overnight drinks or something of this kind. Do you see what I mean? So I think maybe mm-hmm. we need to to rethink that kind of culture and to begin to rein in our use of air flight by 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 staying more local, by finding other ways of um, entertaining ourselves in a in a more confined kind of way. Some people will find that difficult, no doubt, but perhaps in you know the the payoff, as it were, for this would be that we we have the pleasure of knowing that our consumption isn't contributing to a situation that is going to seriously threaten the survival of our children and grandchildren. Uh, and uh, as I as I was saying before, I don't think we've necessarily explored the potential of train transport nearly enough. I mean, we could make trains much more regular and much more um, comfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and something similar, I think, applies even for local transport, where 
Um, I don't know what the visioning is like exactly in the States, but here it's still, in Britain at any rate, it's still very poor. In other parts of Europe it's not so bad at all. But, you know, we could we could make um, provision for bikes, you know, quite quite luxurious, I think, if we were to think in terms of taking the money away from the provision for motorways and putting it into the infrastructure for uh, bike lanes that covered lanes, or at least a colonnade sometimes, or mm-hmm. lighting and properly guarded for children to use to get to school, um, and cafes and, uh, and uh, shower provisions on route and so on. I mean, we haven't, we haven't necessarily begun to think about all the possibilities that uh, it could be, we could introduce for a more Baroque and luxurious style of living were we to give priority to slower modes of transport mm-hmm. or to alternatives to air flight and, and the automobile. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of invention still to come, I hope, you know, if we are going to kind of move in this direction. A lot of new design, a lot of rethinking of our use of resources involved as well, so that we, you know, we minimise the waste that's incurred in primary production, as well as the waste that comes from people chopping up stuff when it, you know, no longer serves them. <coughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think uh, Henry David Thoreau said something along the lines of I'm I'm well traveled and conquered uh, and it it makes me think about just in the past um, in the past year just over a year um, I've gone to two national parks uh, Joshua Tree National Parks and Channel Islands National Park that are within three hours of my my childhood home and one of them I'd never been to and the other one I hadn't mm-hmm. been to since like an elementary school field trip um and just that there you know there are really great destinations that were close by and didn't require flying um that I just maybe wasn't thinking about as a as a first choice yes I mean I think I think that's probably true for a lot of us that we haven't um properly you know we don't we don't take enough notice of what's on our doorstep you could argue Mm -hmm. um and again the pandemic had some impact on this because people kind of opted for stay what they call staycations instead of you know traveling to foreign parts for their holidays and they did uh, also explore their localities more and get great pleasure from doing so in some cases i think so yeah i mean if we are going to commit to sustainable ways of living, then I think we do have to restrain some of our more uh, um, far-flung kinds of ideas of adventure and and, uh, and um, commit to to holidaying and to exploring uh, the environment that's closer to us. But there are, there are you know there are benefits of doing that as well. Um, and in addition to those benefits, there's a sense that at least we are uh, involved in ways of living that will allow for the continuation of the human species as well as all the others who are occupying the planet. So, you know, that's important, I think. That's an important source of pleasure in itself for people. Mm-hmm. Um, one more issue where... Uh... You know, we could. You mentioned where we could see a, a major change is a big part of our consumer lifestyle currently is um, is like being on the internet, uh, fancy new technology, um, spending a lot of time with screens. Um, so, what what role uh, does the sort of I guess decreased screen time have in um, kind of a, a post-growth alternative hedonist imaginary? Well, um, I, I, um, this is quite a controversial area, I imagine, and it's not an area in which I have a great deal of expertise. 
Um, and I'm aware that some people on the left have certainly celebrated the internet as a source of post-capitalist collaborative productivity and abundant provision and endless information. And some of them have suggested, I think, that the Internet of Things is even giving rise to a third industrial revolution and boosting productivity to the point where the marginal costs of producing lots of goods and services is nearly zero and could make them practically free. Um, but, you know, I have my doubts about that, I think, and I've suggested mm. earlier, you know, that the that, that sort of high-tech way of proceeding is not necessarily where we would want to go. So others, including myself, are a bit more spe- sceptical, in part, I think, because there seems little attention paid to the quite massive increase in energy that we're told would be required for that kind of revolution. I mean... I think that power consumption in the um, in that sector is set to triple to triple in just the next five years. Jeez. And in part because too little is said about the electronic waste that would be involved and the problems of its disposal. And the way that disposal currently is caught up in what's sometimes called salvage capitalism. At the, in the peripheral economies where people and lots of them are children are just sitting on these you know, t- extraordinary heaps of uh, cast off electronic waste and subjecting themselves to all sorts of toxic fumes and so on. So I don't think the advocates of a, an endless expansion of the internet have necessarily thought through either how it's going to be um, I don't know about how it's going to be supported in terms of energy input sufficiently, nor about um, what would happen with the waste. Um, And then I think, you know, it's also problematic in some ways from an alternative hedonist point of view um, in virtue of its impacts on uh, human subjectivity. Um, uh, one of the problems, I think, is the amount of screen time that people uh, get kind of caught up in devoting to to the internet, and particularly children, maybe, who are then deprived of other arguably more profitable sort of ways of um, experiencing the world. Uh, and information, although it's true it um, is almost endlessly provided on the internet, um, but information is not quite the same as knowledge or intelligence, and acquiring and sharing information online is not the same as gaining intellectual skills or practical know-how through more hands-on experience or learning in person from an expert practitioner. Mm. So I would say that intellectual and cultural knowledge of the karma used to acquire offline at a slower pace and in a less distractible and distractive mode uh, are also, you know, in a sense sacrificed quite often to the dominance of the internet. Um, so I think there are a number of downsides here. I mean, it also does have its advantages, obviously. Um, and we're not, I can't see us as we were giving up on the um, engagements and even some expansion of the internet. But we need to actually also think about its downsides as well as its more positive aspects. And of course, in terms of information, as we've come to know and regret, it has become a source of very. It has become a, 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 much of the, the so-called information put out is extremely disconcerting, untrue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and I think one of the uh, one of the points you make that I found interesting is this idea of I think you call it like greening our aesthetic response. So, if we're more familiar with, you know the if we've seen visuals of electronic waste or we're more familiar with, you know, mining for materials than, you know, looking at a 
or even if we associate the internet with, uh, you know, the fake news uh, or <laughs> misinformation, uh, just that sort of we might see a shiny new device that if we see it today, it might look very appealing and just kind of have a different gut response as we become kind of more familiar with its life cycle. But if, um, if, if electronics and information might be, you know, like you said, it's not like we're going to abolish the internet and don't necessarily want to do that anyway. Um, and, but if that's, you know, maybe one of the harder cells of, of post growth living, um, I think one that is, has potential to be a really popular element of this program is the idea that we should uh, work less and maybe a lot less. Um, so what, what is a society where we, where we work a lot less look like and, and how might we get there? Well, I, I suspect that even without us moving to a full post growth culture in any near future, we will find that the pressures to reduce work are mounting. Um, partly because of automation. Um, so that I think what what's needed here is a more positive image of the culture of reduced work. In other words, instead of lamenting the unemployment that will be caused and the reduction in work, we need to develop an alternative hedonist case for seizing the opportunity it offers to move from a work-rooted understanding of our identity and purpose in life and self-fulfillment, if we can get it, which we often can't in work anyway, to one that is more, if you like, life-centered or revolves around more self-chosen ways of spending time and energy. Um, so I would argue that we should seize the opportunity of climate change to move to a more humanly oriented post-work order. I'm quite influenced here by the French theorist whose seminal work in this area was very important, I think, namely André Gors. He argued that we can't get rid of all the unpleasant work tasks, but we could organise work culture in ways that meant that people didn't spend all their days doing it. <coughs> so we could move quite readily, I think, to a three or a max four day working week. Um, and the um, benefits of that would be great. I think, if, you know, people would then have more free time, they would be less stressed out at work. Some of the jobs that um, have been described, for example, as bullshit jobs, because, you know, the people themselves working in, this is the, the phrase used by David Graeber, of uh, those working in lot of finance and lots of new administrative areas, who he suggested know very well that their jobs really, there's not much point to them. If you get rid of those kinds of jobs, we could also get rid of a lot of the um, tasks associated with merchandising and advertising and brand enhancement and so on, jobs that I think are very gratifying, that are often you know, performed by people in the gig economy who sense the futility and regret the way in which their jobs are contributing to an unsustainable uh, consumption. Um, so, you know, there would be a lot of advantages. Um, I, you know, I think people will want to go on doing some work. I think work is a, a human need to up to a point, but it shouldn't take over their entire lives, and it should always come with as much fulfilment as possible and rather less stress. So, in that context, I suggested that we might seize an opportunity in moving to a less profit-driven way of living. Um, to reinstate some earlier ways of doing and making things. In other words, we could enjoy what I call more hybrid ways of working. If we became less subject to the law of value, in other words, if we 
managed to escape from the constraints on having to make the maximum amount of stuff in the shortest possible time, then we could, um, you know, we could we could move, we could choose our ways of working much more. We could have some more artisanal methods or slow work that could develop alongside, you know, recourse to very state-of-the-art technologies in some other areas, notably, I would suggest, medicine, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or energy provision. Those those we could kind of have, you know, driven by very high high tech methods, but we could also, alongside that, have recourse to more traditional and slower modes of working in some ways. So and that might allow for the participation of People who are currently kind of in a way cut out from the workforce because their uh, methods aren't going to be sufficient enough. I'm talking about people who are, you know, the elderly maybe, some who still want to go on working, or those with disabilities who are discounted because, you know, they, they're not able to kind of work at the maximum speed and so on. So there would allow more, more flexibility of that, of that kind. I think it would also help to promote... Um, well, it would have to go along, I think, with the introduction of some kind of citizens or universal basic income, uh, which would help uh, guarantee that people had the necessary funds for living and enable them to enjoy their free time more. But it would also, in the process, I think, help to reduce inequalities and promote a less gendered and racialized and class-based um, division of labor. So there's a lot of a lot to be gained, I think, from thinking in terms of moving to a more post-work or what I sometimes call a more ludic culture, one based more around free time and self-provisioning and, um, and collaborative uh, forms communal community based forms of consumption sharing and pooling of cards and so on and so on yeah i think the more free time and more leisure aspect of this is very attractive to me and and probably to a lot of people um and it's it's yeah it's clear how the the working less element ties into the consuming less um because you know if you if you're if you have more free time if you're in less of a hurry then maybe the the train ride doesn't sound as bad or compared to a plane or you know you aren't you don't mind walking or biking if you're in less of a hurry compared to driving yeah um, yeah and, you have more time mm -hmm. and you can also do things for yourself more you know instead of relying on fast food and uh, and the, the the products on the market to make up for the time that you have you know you haven't got to do things for yourself Mm -hmm. sorry go on yeah no, yeah I mean, I mean i think having people having more time to to cook or make their own food or um would be and grow it yeah grow a garden um would be really wonderful um and you know what 40 plus hours a week you just don't have that time uh, most people mm. and mm. yeah it's, it's tied to to um you know you talk about things like uh fast fashion where people are you know just producing new new clothes all the time or with electronics producing new devices well um you mentioned kind of we could have you know repair shops where we actually instead of just replacing everything that is broken um we find a way to actually make things last a long time um we can you know to, our tools can be shared uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that probably sits in people's garage that they don't use more than once a month. Um, you know, there could be tool libraries and there, there's just lots of ways to, to need less stuff. And then when you need less stuff, you need to make less, you don't have to make as much stuff. Mm. And then you probably don't yes, have to I... work as much. Yes. I mean, I think, I think, you know, one of the, uh, we definitely need, I think, to rein in the production of material culture in affluent societies, which would mean that we should, in any case, be spending less time 
on their production. But I think alongside that, we should make the, the production of the goods that we do need, including, as you say, you know, the sort of tools and so on. Firstly, we should make sure that they're produced in a sustainable way as possible. That means cutting out, legislating, I think, against built-in obsolescence, which is still very prevalent in a lot of um, goods produced on the market. So we should have upcycling of you know, zero-waste production methods <coughs> for those goods. But they can also feature as, as things that we could share more, so that we would cut back on individualised possession. There would be perhaps the provision of hubs on the high street for for um, sharing tools, for hiring or sharing tools, um, for repairing all sorts of things that we tend to do more individually at present. It would also, as you say, cut down on clutter. Um, I mean, I think one in ten American households already has to hire extra space in addition to their house for the uh, goods that they can't store there, that they've acquired. And I think of quite a lot of goods are actually seldom used probably and they do involve a lot more maintenance and cleaning and so on even if they are so it, yeah there's a lot of opportunities here i think to move to a less um to, to a way of living that's less dependent on acquiring um, uh, acquiring more stuff more we would just have to i think commit to a less positive culture on that at the individual level and it would mean it would certainly mean a less fashion-driven culture as well. Um, one, the downside for some people might be that they could no longer look to their material consumption as a way of um, displaying their status or being in some sort of competition, joining this, what's sometimes called the hedonic treadmill, where everybody's kind of looking to each other to compete in. Uh, to in their, their ever more kind of conspicuous or expanded kind of forms of consumption and so on. Um, <clears throat> that would that would no longer be available, if you like, as a way of gaining the respect or admiration of your uh, fellows. On the other hand, um, if you did actually get rid of quite a lot of uh, the uh, fast fashion production, um, you would put pay to an enormous amount of waste. I mean, masses of goods produced in fast fashion just shoveled into incinerators because they're not sold even. And, and masses more sort of hangs on news and wardrobes and so on. So there's a lot of peril that goes to waste anyway from that kind of production. Um, but you could also, you know, by shifting to more self-making and self-revisioning, make a thing of eccentricity. I mean, there is a lot of invention here that people could kind of explore if they, as compensation, if you like, for the loss of what they get from following mm -hmm. fashion. And in a way, following fashion is not always a way of displaying your individuality, after all. Um, fashion is sort of to do with with people, um, nobody cares who you are as long as enough people follow a fashion. They're not really about about um, allowing you to explore your more individualised kind of self. So there are there are gains and losses here, but I think you know we need to actually emphasise some more of the things that could be uh, be there to enhance our lives if we were to live more sustainably. One one last question. Um, I think you you mentioned the the need for public conversations around these issues, also potentially you know bringing them up more in, in private conversations. Um, so just kind of what what advice do you have, uh, or maybe tips and pointers for for people who want to broach some of these issues of of changing consumption. Um, but maybe are either don't know how to get, um, you know, get taken seriously or don't want to come across as a scold or, uh, you know, uh, worried about coming across as, or, or at least being painted as 
um, you know, trying to take away people's pleasures or something, even though it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a difficult issue, isn't it? Because I think when people uh, hear about, I mean, for a long time, I sing Greens and the Green Parties and um, and various supportive um, movements, NGOs, were regarded as, you know, <laughs> taking us back to the Stone Age or, mm -hmm. or maybe to the medieval period, <laughs> a bit more charitably. And it was thought that, you know, that, you know, they were somehow, uh, yeah, spoiling our pleasures and so on. And I think as a result of that, quite a lot of people who are perhaps, um, you know, in sympathy with the idea of moving to greener ways of living are also nervous about broaching the idea uh, because it might seem as if they kill joys. What they need to do, I think, is to, um, you know, it, it, to give more space to the actual pleasures that could come from opting for greener and more sustainable ways of living um, and um, develop, a, if you like, an alternative hedonist case for it. I also think, however, that the other, you know, the other aspect that maybe we need to say a bit more on and which I think is also quite embarrassing for people and I would include myself here it's very difficult to challenge people at the level of their consumption um, but in a way maybe we do need sometimes to rethink our embarrassment at that level after all if it as looks increasingly the case if we trust the climate scientists we are not going to uh, get much beyond, you know, the next hundred years unless we radically uh, change our ways. Then we're talking really about the survival of all future generations. We're talking about maybe the long-term well-being of our own children, um, certainly of their children. Now, if that's the case, it's not entirely clear why we should be more squeamish about challenging very vandalizing or profligate forms of consumption. Um, why should we be more squeamish about that than we have been in challenging sexism when it, when it comes to issues of gender politics or racism, when it comes to issues of ethnic difference and so on. So. There is a way in which I think perhaps we need to have more, you know, have more courage of our convictions about the way in which current consumption is actually actively preempting the well-being of future generations, so that we have a responsibility to those future generations, and that itself should, you know, give us pause for thought. Um, mm -hmm about about how we how we consume um, but uh, I mean I I sympathize uh, with people who do find it difficult um, I, it, you know there are obviously organizations uh, green parties and, and um, NGOs of various kinds that they can join up with but when it you know it's difficult I think broaching these kinds of issues just amongst friends and family and so on. Um, however, uh, more of us are doing it now and there is a great deal more engagement, isn't there, already with the necessity of rethinking our uh, previous kind of marginalisation of environmental issues than there was even five years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. That was Kate Soper, author of Post-Growth Living for an Alternative Hedonism. Thanks so much for listening. Um, if you like this episode, the best thing you can do is sign up for my weekly newsletter. You'll get, like I said earlier, uh, new episodes in your inbox every week, along with other fun stuff. Um, and if you're already in the newsletter, uh, or even if you're not, um, the best thing you can do for this podcast is... Send it to someone you think would like it. Forward the email, uh, send the link, just share and spread the word so that others could listen as well.
which would make me feel good and hopefully them too so uh yeah thanks for listening uh and have a great day